The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us. Uh, great to have my co-hosts, Phil Ordway and Elliot Turner. We have uh, an interesting discussion ahead, so let's launch right into it. Phil, over to you. Thanks, John. I know we've talked about the bond market before, but I thought it, it, I've been reading a bunch lately that's made me think that now is now is probably the most pivotal time to to revisit this and to really make some thoughtful decisions about where things might go from here because we've obviously endured this massive change over the past couple of years. So for anyone who hasn't been paying attention, we're very likely to end this year, <clears throat> barring something very unexpected. This year will mark the third consecutive year with a loss in the treasury market. So treasuries as a whole are down about 40 to 45 percent from their peak two years ago uh and and to have a loss in three consecutive years uh, again the data aren't exactly all that reliable but the last time this apparently happened was in the 1780s the 1780s like george washington type stuff it didn't even happen in the 70s or the 80s of the 1900s so this really is crazy stuff but I, i'm coming up with some really conflicting thoughts and opinions. And I, I want to throw out some data and some numbers and see where you guys are are shaking out on this. Because again, in case, so we're recording this today is uh, November 1st, 2023. And last week or in the last, you know, call it five to 10 days, uh, treasury yields, the US 10 year hit 5% for the first time since July of 2007. Uh, Thirty-year treasuries also hit five percent recently. They've they've backed down a touch, back underneath five percent since then. Le at one point, though, only the five-year treasury was still below five percent. So again, there's this massive fight happening in the bond market where the yield curve was inverted for so long. It's flattened out in a big way. Uh, just as we're recording this today, the Fed came out and said they were holding interest rates flat for the time being, but the market clearly doesn't know what to make of this, right? Or I should say the market is clearly betting that this is not a permanent solution. The market is is making a pretty profound statement that rates have more or less peaked and that there's going to be some relief in, in terms of rate declines in 2024. And I want to examine the logic behind that. As we stand here today, high yield corporate spreads are still really tight, in my opinion. You know, call it 350, 400, 450 basis points over treasury, something like that. That seems crazy to me, given the amount of leverage in the system and the amount of private equity backed deals done at seven, eight, 10 turns of leverage now um, that are likely going to have to be refinanced at much higher rates and, and could well incur the risk of default. And again, this bodes well for active managers and credit analysts. We'll come back to that in a minute. But if you were to just go buy the I, the HYG, the the high yield index, uh, I don't know. That seems that seems a little rough from here, if you ask me. Investment grade corporates are only yielding about six and a quarter, and mind you, that's the highest absolute level since two thousand nine. But I mean, seriously, you're going to accept a hundred basis points over cash. I mean, that seems completely nuts. I, I don't, I mean, I guess I would rather own treasuries or I would rather own corporates rather than just make a pure duration bet on on other, on treasuries, but it, that still seems pretty nuts to me. Uh, equity yields even too are starting to look a little thin vis-a-vis -vis the yields on, on treasury bills or cash, right? I mean, the earnings yield of the S&P 500 
is well below 5%, right? And the dividend yields about one and three quarters, a little less than one and three quarters. Mind you, you know, there's obviously growth and there's pricing power and, and equities don't have a, a stated fixed coupon like bonds do. But again, I I just, that may not look quite so attractive overall either. And in my opinion, people are definitely chasing things right now. Like I, in, in, there's no clearer view of that than, than there's, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal I read, I think it came out last week, that there are something like $20 billion of flows just in the past few months into the TLT, which is the iShares 20-year plus treasuries ETF that has a duration of over 16 years. And it's down 50% from its peak a few years ago. So you've lost half your money if you're in the TLT. But again, it seems driven by things that frankly, scare me as an investor. Don't get me excited about it. So, you know, you think, wow, this thing's down 50%. This must be an interesting time to buy, right? It's it's a trading sardine. Like there's the options market on this bond ETF is insane. Like I started going down this rabbit hole and I was just amazed at the pure casino-like speculation happening in this thing. It has nothing to do with economic fundamentals. It's just people YOLOing duration, whether or not they realize it, that's what they're doing. And it seems totally nuts to me. So. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, other bond indexes and ETFs that are out there that you could make. I mean, part of the problem is if you do one of the major indices, right, like the AGG, the iShares Core US Aggregate Bond Fund, it yields a little less than 5%, but it has six years, more than six years of duration, and it's below its price of 15 years ago. So, yes, you've had income along the way that's, of course, taxable, but it's kind of been a disaster. And all you're doing there is making a dread on a bet on duration. All of the big indices have, you know, well over half, usually three quarters or more of the assets are in treasuries and agencies. And so you're not getting much real exposure to corporate. So it's really just, are you better at picking the right point along the curve and and, and nailing your duration call over the rest of the market? I, I tend to doubt it. I mean, some of these numbers too, just to point how bad it's been to get here are, are really quite stunning. The AGG year-to-date down almost 3%, down slightly over five years. If you've held it for 15 years, you've made a whopping 2.5% a year. BND, another big one, 2.8% down this year. Uh, Again, slightly down over the last five years, and you've made 2.4% over the long haul. On an active fund, one of the big PIMCO funds, a multi-sector bond fund, PONAX, up slightly this year, 1.1%. It, you, if you've held it for five years, you've made 1.6%. You have done better, about 6.7% over 15 years. But that's a long time, and not too many people have stuck around. Muni's, not a whole lot better. MUB is down 2% this year, up 1% per year over five years, up 3.3% over 15 years. I mean, these are really terrible numbers, right? I mean, it's just kind of shocking. And so, you know, the the numbers that are getting thrown around by the bulls, which have some merit and validity are that, you know, tips are now offering like a two and a half percent real yield. And that's by far the juiciest. And I'd say juiciest with some irony yield that you've seen in a long time. But is that enough? Um, 30 year treasuries now, I mean, this is where people, again, I get it. It's somewhat favorable, but I don't really see it being all that. I don't see the odds being really all that much in your favor. But yes, the, the bond math would imply that if rates go down 50 basis points from here, and you owned a 30-year treasury, you'd make about 12, 13, 14% over the next 12 months between the combination of appreciation and, and, and the coupons. So that's okay. That's good. That's a, that's a nice number. And you'd, I say only, only lose 3% if rates go up 50 basis points. I mean, what happens if the 10-year goes to seven or eight? I mean, that's not impossible. And again, the, the, the reason we're in this world of pain uh, and suffering that's taken what will be now three calendar years to work off is because everybody got the fatigue of saying, well, rates are going to go up eventually, but not now, right? They, they they lost their discipline saying that, yeah, I know that rates can't stay at zero forever. And I know we're in the middle of this horrible pandemic. And I know the world is full of all this crazy stuff, but like they, they just lost their discipline. They, they couldn't sit there and imagine to themselves a world where this would happen and rates would shoot straight up and you'd get over 5% on T-bills, but but here we are. So I really don't know if I see it as all that an attractive environment. Um, but one thing that is starting to get my attention 
So I, I called out earlier how unattractive the the high yield uh, index has been. And again, to, just to run through those numbers, the HYG year to date is actually up 2.7%. It's only up 1.7% a year if you've held it for the last five years. It is up a little more than 6% a year if you've held it for the last 15 years. That to me would be probably a pretty reasonable baseline, I would say. Like if you were going to hold the HYG going forward and expect a whole lot less than 6% over 15 years, like something really bad must have happened. And if you were going to expect something, you know, more than six or seven or eight percent, like something really, really favorable and unlikely also happened there. So that that does seem like a good baseline there. But again, I don't is six percent enough when you can hang out in cash right now for five and look for better opportunities. But anyway, this is where I think it gets really interesting for investors is you can make a much bigger difference um, as an active manager in a discrete portfolio, whether I mean not everybody has that mandate, of course, in a professional sense, but you as an individual investor uh, certainly do. And I, I came across a corporate issue the other day. Uh, it's a it's a below investment grade issue. It's it's a BA3 at Moody's actually not rated by S&P. I won't say what it is, but it's a company you would have all heard of and known uh, based in the US. Uh, it's actually secured uh, by collateral that I find quite attractive. There's about $1.1 billion outstanding under the two issues uh, on this indenture. And it actually matures in about a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half, the fall of 2025. And as recently as October 1st, it was trading around par with an 8% coupon. And the company reported earnings during October, as you might imagine, the earnings weren't real great. The stock got smoked to the tune of double digits. But then all of a sudden, somebody started panic selling this bond and it's down more than 30 points. It's not even clear where it is going to trade right now. I'm not sure if it's traded yet today, um, but it was being indicated today uh, in the 60s. And again, this was a bond at 94 last week um, and, and the earnings were out on the 26th. So it's not all attributable to that. Somebody is just panic selling this. And so this is where it gets really interesting. Now, you now have a piece of paper where, it, and again, I haven't bought it. I haven't done all of my homework on this yet, but if I'm right, uh, the collateral more than covers the debt the chances of a bankruptcy are obviously real, but I wouldn't say that they're unduly high. I would say at best, it's a five or 10% chance of a bankruptcy before this issue matures. If there is a bankruptcy before this issue matures, I would think that this piece of paper would recover would recover quite well, at least based on the math that I'm doing right now. And so your yield to worst in this scenario is approaching 30%, 30%. And it to me, it seems all because someone is just panic selling this, this bond. There's there's basically identical bonds with identical collateral at their respective competitors, um, and the paper hasn't traded off there hardly at all. So someone is just blowing out of this. And because there's been such a structural change in the market where uh, market makers and broker dealers don't hold nearly the inventory that they used to, and there's just not nearly the liquidity in, in some of these issues that people might assume there to be, if somebody decides to sell, it's look out below. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. So I'm going to be spending a lot more time looking for this type of thing. But again, so what I'll stop there. And the question I want to pose to you guys is, um, do you think it's too soon and too early for most corporate issues as I do? But, you know, at the same line, the same direction, if you do think that, I think now is the time to get prepared. And what do you think about the idea of extending out into some duration now, it, whether it's in your personal portfolio or in a professional context. I mean, again, my thought there would be sure it might make sense to take a bit more duration now. I, I don't buy the notion that you're going to completely miss the boat if you make 5% holding cash. I mean, the <laughs> rates are very unlikely to just plummet straight back down to zero. And if they do, so what? You'll be okay. <laughs> the rest of your portfolio will do quite well if that happens. And I just can't get over the people that are out here, you know, trading long duration bond ETFs like they're at a casino. Uh, and the last thing I guess I'd say, maybe the most important part of this this whole little spiel is that what's sort of a desert island kind of bet you'd make here? So, you know, people play this game all the time. I think it's actually a pretty useful game. Like if, if you had to go away on a desert island for five years or 10 years and you could you couldn't monitor your portfolio at all. You couldn't certainly couldn't trade anything in the portfolio at all. What would you buy? What would you do? And so if you had the same sort of constraint on buying 
10-year treasuries or 30-year treasuries, what kind of yield would you demand to lock that up for 10 years where there was absolutely no chance of trading or or getting out of it? You just kind of had to lock in uh, your position there. So I'll, I'll ask you guys for your thoughts on that, and then I'll reply with mine. Yeah, you set the stage really nicely with this. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to to think about. Um, so to your point on like, should we be looking in corporate credits today uh, for opportunities? I think the answer is absolutely, especially with the kind of uh, setup you'd outlined. I wouldn't necessarily be interested in a high yielding bond at par, but one where the company is factoring in a like distress and yet they're not distressed and the yield is really nice. Um, your chance for a really great IRR is even better. So it's a great yield, but also you might get uh, back to par a lot sooner than you'd otherwise expect. Um, so I think that's super interesting. And it's something that I'd been thinking about myself and I'd been screening around for those kinds of opportunities. And you'll have to tell me what that bond is because man, do I want to know. Um, in terms of, you know, like the general outlook on yields and where things are trading, I mean, I did have a few comments on some of the pieces you'd laid out. So I was wondering this very same question about why we are not seeing a spike in uh, credit spreads, where like high yield is a very small premium to treasuries. Uh, and I got a really good answer. And, and I think it makes a whole lot of sense from one of my friends who is in these markets day in, day out. And one of the realities of today's rate environment is that the U.S. is way ahead of the rest of the world. And we're a really big liquid market, as we all know. And so when the U.S. Uh, corporates are trading at like three to four points higher than European ones that are no le- more or less credit worthy, you're seeing crossover buying across the Atlantic because... I mean, even with FX risk or even with the cost of hedging, you know, especially for institutional demand, it's just worth the yield pickup. It's kind of a no-brainer. So there have been massive inflows from overseas, and those have been quantified. But that's been also met with much reduced issuance. Not a lot of companies are issuing high yield debt, um, and a lower degree. And some companies are retiring debt. So you might even be seeing like net negative issuance here. So um, those forces, I think, are also illuminated in in uh, sovereign stuff where Greek long-term debt was trading at a lower interest rate than U.S. long-term debt. Like who in their right minds would rather own? I get it. I get it. Greece has come a long way from where it was a decade ago. But still, like, wouldn't you just rather, if if this is your risk-free by the U.S. And actually there, you might even get favorable FX. Um, So I think that's a big part of what's happening. And I do think to this question of uh, duration, like, yeah, it's it's becoming a very big, I think, headwind for equities, because I do think a lot of people are thinking, well, you know, I haven't had yield for a long time. I've planned my retirement based on the 4% rule of thumb. And I could just take 5% and lock it in for a long time. So I get it. The money market's yielding a little more than is the 10-year treasury. But but give me the 10-year treasury and let me just sleep well at night and not face some of these risks that I, that I otherwise would be thinking about. Um, so I do think that matters. And on the TLT stuff, I don't really know exactly how to think of it. I do think that's part of it. I do think there's a degree to which, like, I, I'd remembered, re- like, just being mind blown at how much the net inflow was to USO the whole time oil was imploding. Um, But I also wonder how much of this is like the actual marketable supply of long duration treasuries is going way up too, right? There's been a lot more issuance from the treasury and the Fed itself is selling. So maybe it's also a function of meeting supply um, that's out there and rates, you know, like kind of encourage you in into there. So it's not, the whole thing. And um, then I did want to like throw this out. I mean, I don't know what you might or might not want to believe about their earnings yield on 24 expectations. But according to Yardeni, on uh, on the close of the month, we were at a 17x PE on the S&P. So that's, that's a yield above the 10-year uh, treasury, 5.8% earnings yield on equities. And 
theoretically it it's growing, a, but it must be a forward number. Pretty. It is a forward number. Yeah, it's next yeah. twelve months. Absolutely, yeah. and that's actually, uh, you know, I, I, for what it's worth, I mean, it might miss, it might not, but that uh, number has been ticking up as these earnings reports have been coming in, even though companies stocks are, have not been treating kindly. So maybe that's part of why that 17 X had been, you know, 19 X just not that long ago, uh, because we are seeing, um, stock prices go down as, uh, earnings estimates go up. And then one funny thing, like before I get to my desert Island answer, I know this has been a pretty long prelude, uh, getting there, but like I was looking at a company over the last two days, where they're valued on like price to sales. The big uh, complaint about the company is they're losing money on an EBITDA basis, but they are like severely net cash as a percent of their market cap. So their EV is very small relative to their market cap. And with money market interest rates, you actually almost get them to be cash break even. And I've seen a few setups like this. I've seen a few setups where like, you know, cash making money, cash making companies are actually like far more cash making than you'd otherwise expect because the EVs have compressed so much. I think those kinds of setups are super interesting here because you could kind of buy bonds or, or like short, you could buy short term rates, um, but with equity optionality, where if like any sort of degree of market cap is priced into these companies, um, you're 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 going to get something interesting. And then in terms of like Desert Island, the one I've been thinking a lot about. Um, is that this has been the most severe bear market in the history of the biotech sector. Of all bear markets the sector has ever had. And I think the science has never been more promising. And biotechs are tough, but like tools and instruments are kind of a picks and shovels play on that. And I do think there are some incredible opportunities there if you can get some help. It's a really tough area from a, for a generalist. And if you could get comfortable with some of the l- language and um, all that, uh, but I, I don't want to get much deeper into the weeds on that, but that's one of the areas that I've been thinking like, you know, what will be the tech of the next cycle? Cause we're going to have a bull cycle again one day. I do think it'll be the biotechs. They've actually gone nowhere for eight years uh, and, and the related companies, eight years of bear market in, in mm-hmm. this space, basically. Um, and you have the highest number of companies ever in the space trading for below their actual cash value. So I think you're starting to see some incentive to not even like have these companies pursue their pipelines, but to break themselves up and sell off their assets. So um, I think there's going to be some crazy stuff. There was a company just this morning who they got an equity infusion that was 3x their market cap at 5x their stock price at the prior day's close, as well as a licensing payment that was uh, 50% of their market cap. And the stock, like relative to all this, has hardly budged. And I've seen other, like, absolutely insane deals in the space. Um, so, yeah, that's the one, one area I'd say, you know, if you could go to sleep for 10 years, like, this stuff's going to normalize uh, some of the co- post COVID wonkiness that's happened. Um, and then, yeah, that rate that I just take and I'd go to sleep with seven percent is that magic number, I think. Um, so, you know, that's that's what I throw out to your desert uh, desert island number the, on rates for the ten year. Anyway, yeah, for the ten year, ten year. So okay. I've thrown a lot at you there. I'm sure you got some comments back of that too. No, no, I, I, it's all good stuff. I think seven. I'll wait for John. I'll wait for John on that. What do you think, John? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, I think. There have been a lot of smart people on that, um, you know, on the other side of the TLT long trade, so to speak. So basically short TLT or long TBT um, way before it ever paid off. And and probably a lot of folks kind of um, gave up on that trade. Um, I think basically uh to me you really got to consider kind of the direction of the causality here uh just inflation is what's been driving rates higher and um you know i i can't comment on short term uh swings in inflation you know month to month or even quarter to quarter 
uh, or even short-term uh, moves in interest rates. I mean, we live in a very uncertain world, uh, both economically and geopolitically, so anything could happen to interest rates in the short term. Um, but I think we are in a longer-term environment of structural inflation, and uh, interest rates are still... Um, you know, not totally reflecting that. So I, for one, would not be moving out on the on the curve in terms of taking on duration. Um, you know, any kind of nominal interest rate um, on the kind of on the curve is kind of suspect to me. When you were talking about, um, you know, tips having a real yield, um, that's if you accept the way that the CPI is calculated. Oh, that's true. Yeah, um, that's true. So does it really reflect um, people's actual living costs and the way those are, have gone up and are still going up? Um, you know, that's that's questionable. I mean, I think we're just basically seeing the inevitable effects of the lack of discipline uh, on the fiscal and monetary side um, that have been around for many years and the incentives are still such that they will continue uh, just given how indebted uh, the government is and that it's just easier politically to um, expand the Fed's balance sheet, to print money, to inflate your way out of the debt situation and so, you know, whatever kind of nominal yield you can get um, in fixed income, to me, there's kind of a burden of proof uh, because I feel like people will still get burned. Even if long-term rates go to 7%, to me, that's saying inflation's probably going to be around 10% or higher for quite a while. Um, so I would seek shelter in real estate or equities or, um, actual real, uh, commodities, and those are going to be volatile. So you're not going to have your predictable nominal return, but I think if you are a long-term, uh, investor and looking to protect your wealth, uh, in real terms over the long term. Um, you have to accept some volatility in the short term in order to actually own assets that, you know, are in limited supply, unlike uh, the money supply. So, right. you know, that's kind of where I'm still at, despite the, um, you know, move up in rates that we've had. Yeah, fair enough. So where would you be on the tenure to just go away? To go away, meaning... Meaning my, like you would, yeah, you put into a big it? chunk of money in the 10 year and then be totally locked up for the duration of the bond 10 years. There's no interest rate. I just wouldn't <laughs> trust it. Even at 20%, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. I mean, seriously. Really? Yeah. To me, it's, uh, it's just that whatever it is, I'm on the other side of that, you know, par, if you will. Uh, but clearly there would be some rate for most people and that's that's how the market's going to shake out but uh, i'm not going to be anywhere near the market clearing uh, interest rate on that yeah fair enough i would be somewhere around seven to eight percent is what i wrote down and at least 100 to 200 higher than that for the 30 year so i think it maybe is getting to the same point that you are though john in practical terms which is that this is probably if you're thinking about it in terms of where things are a couple of years from now, how the economy is reacting to whatever level of inflation we're about to experience, I, I don't see the odds as being super favorable right now to lock up a bunch of duration. So sure, could you go out a little bit further? And if you're particularly, let's say you're a retiree and you live you know, with enough savings and a modest lifestyle and you could lock up, I think I wrote it down here, I think the uh the muni bond where did i put that uh yeah so if you're in the top tax bracket a triple a rated muni for 30 years yields the tax after tax equivalent of about six percent um and if you said all right that's good enough for me um 
Uh, it doesn't get me excited. It makes me a little uncomfortable just because of the relatively high opportunity cost, but it's not totally insane. But yeah, if you're saying I'm going to lock up treasury, I'm going to buy a 30-year treasury at 5%, I, I don't see how someone could see that as super favorable. To me, that's a pretty bold and clear bet on falling rates. And and look, I get it. There's horrible things going on in the world right now, and there's lots of scary stuff. And And the economic situation is unclear at best, and maybe things are slowing down and we're about to go in reverse and we're about to have you know, either a longer pause or an outright reversal next year. But why do I want to make that bet as an investor? That's that's not for me. So a recession right. hedge would be it, right? You're kind of getting at that. It's for the yeah. kind of person who might be like, hey, I need a percentage of my portfolio in a recession hedge. Yeah, but that's kind of my problem, right? Is <laughs> the kind of person who thinks like that has probably lost a gazillion dollars <laughs> playing that game over time because they've been calling for a recession. So I wrote this down actually in in preparing this. Uh, according to the Bloomberg Economics Forum, which I believe, I have to check this, I've not uh, verified what the actual forecasting metric is, um, but in October of 20, October 17th of 2022, so almost exactly one year ago, uh, the Bloomberg Economics Forum said there was a 100% chance of a recession within 12 months. And I did exactly- see that, yep. We're exactly 12 months after that, and we, in fact, did not have a recession by anyone's definition of it. The definition is arbitrary and stupid, but I don't care what definition you want to use. We didn't have one in the last 12 months, and whatever idiot or group of idiots issued 100% probability of that should be completely embarrassed because there's no 100% chance of anything in life, particularly in macroeconomic forecasting. And that seemed to me like a particularly stupid 100% forecast because there's no possible way you could have come up with a super high number. I mean, even the people that said it was 80 or 90% likely a year ago were just vastly overconfident in what they saw as the future. Uh, to me, you have to be far more humble and take a far more clear-eyed view of base rates, or better yet, just don't play the game. I mean, I think the best way to to hedge a recession risk, like you said, Elliot, is to say, okay, I don't know what the odds are of a recession over the next 12 months. But if a recession were to happen, what would the consequences be? And if the consequences would be, you know, golly gee, my equity portfolio is down 20% or 30% and life goes on, who cares? You don't need to buy insurance. Self-insure and make sure you have a little bit of cash laying around and buy more when bargains pop up and move on with things. If you desperately can't sustain can't sustain or can't withstand a 20 to 30% drop in your equity portfolio, that means you probably have the wrong equity portfolio or the wrong portfolio overall. So I would argue that the portfolio construction is a bigger issue than needing to buy endless amounts of insurance for what should regarded be regarded as an inevitable thing. We are going to have a recession at some point. We are going to have another 20, 30% drawdown in the equity market. It will happen. It's just a matter of if. It, it's a matter of when, not if. So prepare on that basis and don't try to get too cute You know, buying hedges. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's it's one of the hardest things to do in the world, and uh, I think it's uh, notable that like the the recession prognostications of last year, um, theoretically, should have been like a good thing for the sixty forty to have delivered balance over the course of a year, and it's been anything but. It's been basically the worst epic possible for the sixty forty portfolio. No, it really has. It's made a lot of people question the six. I did look it up. I I didn't. I forgot to look up what it is this year. Uh, maybe I can do it while we're talking here. But last year, in in calendar twenty two, the sixty forty portfolio was down about sixteen percent. I mean, that's that's terrible. That, that's not a balanced hedged anything. That's just normal failure to foresee the future as people often do, right? I mean, they thought they owned some sort of protection. How can you think that you're hedged when you own bonds at a crazy level? The 40 there is is not only not providing you protection, it's adding to the problem in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. right? You've now dug yourself into a hole. And I was talking about this the other day with some of somebody in the banking world. And it's like, look, if you just couldn't withstand the fact that your quarterly earnings were going to be lower for a while, unless you went out on the curve and took more duration to juice your yield or your net interest margin a little bit or, or generate a higher return in the portfolio, that's that's not good. Like That's the opposite of what you should be doing as a disciplined banker, right? Which is to say, look, what's the safest, best loan we can make today? 
And secondarily, what's the safest, best securities portfolio we can we can generate today that that asset and liability matches our portfolio as best as possible? Right. This is not about maximizing quarterly income or making sure we don't have a year over year EPS decline when we report next quarter. Like that is how you get into big problems. And that's how you have a lot of these banks with a massive hole in their balance sheet right now. The, the most recent numbers, they're not out for September 30th yet, but the most recent numbers as of the end of June were $558 billion of unrealized losses in the held to maturity, had mostly in the held to maturity portfolio and partially in the available for sale portfolio on bank balance sheets half a trillion dollars, right? And that, look, it's not a credit issue. The credit will be fine. Uh, you know, that that is not what they were doing. They were just taking stupid duration risk. And now they have to earn their way out of that over the next, you know, it's going to be, and that number undoubtedly got worse in the third quarter, right? Because by the way, I don't think people have stopped to think about this necessarily unless they've been reading about it and, and actively thinking about it. But the 10 year, do you guys know where the 10 year treasury was in April? It's obviously right around 5% right now, a little less. Just back in April, you know, six months 3%. ago, seven months ago. Yeah, three and a half. It's unbelievable, right? It's 4% in August. And again, it just shot straight up in the third quarter. And so that's just going to exacerbate the pain for anybody that was clinging to their duration. So it's not good. Not good for them. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to be. And by the way, this was an interesting anecdote, in fact, that I came up with. Somebody went back and calculated just the arithmetic average of the 10-year note, the yield on the 10-year note going all the way back to 1790. Again, we're going back to George Washington times here. What would your guess be on, on what the note, the average yield on the 10-year has been? Probably right around where we are right here. Bingo. You guys are winning. 5%. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're winning all the, the guessing games today. This is good. It's, no, I was uh, way light on the 10-year. If I said three and it was three and a half. Just well, from a duration I mean, adjusted perspective. Yeah, it's, it's not crazy far off. I think a but lot on of this, people, I'll take credit. <laughs> I think a lot of people would have said, like, oh, it's at four or four and a half earlier this year. Like, no, it was at four in August and it was at three and a half in the spring. And yeah, the average 10 year note yield has been about four and a half, pushing up toward five. And, you know, so again, a little right around where we are today, a little lower. But um, so again, this is not some sort of like, generational moment. And again, what, what really kind of bothers me about saying, well, let, you know, the bond market's been bleeding for three years, you know, rates are higher than they've been in a lot of people's investing lifetimes, right? I mean, you're talking about stuff and getting back to levels where it was in, in 2007, 2008, 2009, you've got major ETFs that are now below their NAV or their price from 15 years ago. You know, a lot of people making these decisions that are in the prime of their savings years, weren't investing at all back then, right? Because they were in high school or whatever. And so uh, the problem that I have, though, is that people just seem so willing to make these bold calls and say, oh, well, the, the bottom's in. You know, I, I've nailed it. I, I know how exactly how the bond market's going to behave now. This is it. It's like, okay, whoa, slow down. Easy. Like, it's not that simple. And when I see people like they undoubtedly were, if you go back and read old newspaper articles or whatever from you know, the late seventies or early eighties and everybody's saying, Oh my God, like rates will never go down. The yeah, equities are terrible. This is just the worst, right? Like the pessimism reigns supreme and that's what you want, right? You want to buy from pessimists. You don't want to buy from total optimists. And so that's what makes me nervous, particularly on a behavioral side of just going all in on, on the bond market right now. It just seems, seems counter counterproductive. Yeah, although I don't hear that optimism. Like, I, I get it. There's a lot of issuance in TLT. I just don't hear it. And I feel like it's hard to judge from something like that because it's definitely a number that exists in a in a vacuum of sorts. Um, well, it definitely but does. But you just have to look at flows and behavior. The Barron's think, cover right? this week, right? The Barron's cover this week. I didn't week, think I'm of pretty, that. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, I'm was pretty like sure it was, was uh, it's a good time to buy bonds. Yeah, yeah, oh, it was. It was Literally, it's time to stop crying about bonds. Buy them instead. But I think <laughs> exactly, it, I right? think that's a smart title insofar as part of the problem is people have held bonds through this all. Um, mm. So like, how do you step up and become a buyer when you're tapped out with your exposure in the first place? Right. Um, I, I think that's the challenge. But, uh, but that's, one of the interesting that's why questions. I said earlier, I think the point is you need to keep, you know, dry powder available. And when your dry powder right now returns 5%, it's like an inverse opportunity cost, right? It, it, yep. it reduces the pain of waiting if you just stay liquid and short and you say, you know, 
I'm going to wait and see what comes next. Maybe there's better days ahead. So what would be your like target duration uh, to lock up right now if you had to choose where the well, curve is today? Let's <clears throat> assume it's all flat because it's close, but not quite there. Yeah, it is. It's pretty flat. It's pretty interesting. I, I guess my first and overriding thought would be, I don't know, and I know that I don't know. So I would try to asset and liability match as closely as possible, right? If I was running an insurance company or a bank, I would say now is not the time to get cute and make some contrarian bet in in either direction, even if one direction is definitely not contrarian at the moment. Um, so, and if I were a uh, a saver trying to build a retirement nest egg, I would be willing to go further out in that sense, and that my my liabilities are, you know, hopefully many decades, but I sure as hell wouldn't be taking decades of duration risk. I would say I would be really nervous going out. Be, so uh, let's say I ran a either my own retirement account where I'm going to live till I'm 95 or I'm running a endowment or a foundation or something with a with an even longer time horizon. I would be really nervous having any sort of portfolio wide duration beyond three years, something really short. Yeah, two's been my magic number here. So I think that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the shorter, the better, right? I mean, frankly, I, I could envision going into that committee if I were running that and saying, look, why are we screwing around with this at all? If it was truly like a fresh, clean sheet of paper and say like, I, I'm not going to sit here and cry over spilled milk if we're in all T-bills and rates go way back down. Okay, I, I, that's that's an unlikely outcome. Is it possible? Sure, but it's so unlikely, and it comes with such a muted opportunity cost that that is not going to bother me at all. That's part of what I like about the two year. It's like it's long enough that I, you know, it, and short enough on both uh, both fronts. <laughs> right, right. Like if exactly. the Fed raised one or two more times, you know, okay, I wouldn't I wouldn't be too upset about missing out on a little extra money market pickup. But uh, so, but yeah, if um. You know, things do come in. Maybe you get a little extra upside, but not not much uh, in locked in yield. So right. it seems pretty balanced all around. Anything beyond that, I think you get into like hairier questions about things that I just have no ability to even think about. Exactly, but but that's the problem, right? Not, like none of the banks, nobody at Silicon Valley Bank had any magic duration forecasting abilities. Uh, obviously, <laughs> they've proven that much. <laughs> So what the hell were they doing making a bet the ranch style position out of a out of a long duration portfolio? It's crazy. That one is obvious to me. It was adverse incentives. They couldn't risk right. letting their right. earnings stream today go down. Right. But you know, it was in, that, in, just that. In that choosing alone. to not let their earnings stream go down, they let the whole institution go down. That's the problem. Right? Yep. And that's what you just can't do. Exactly. On that note, guys, thank you so much. Fascinating discussion. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as well. Take care for now. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.